we have got mining post harving with three industry experts and i appear to only have one here for now so uh, i'm gonna bring him in and hi i have no name listed on your uh on your i'm alex 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 but i guess not yes yeah from uh, legal um so we're missing two of our uh, panelists at the moment um harry i think is about to join us i think this yeah here we've got harry hi harry hey pete how are you bud nope. I'm good, man. How are you? Living a little quarantine lifestyle. Whereabouts are you based? Uh, I'm about an hour north of the city. Uh, you could not have told me three or four months ago I would be moving into my parents' empty house with my girlfriend and my sister. But here we are. <laughs> a lot of people have been moving into their parents' houses. Well, listen, we're waiting for Matt. Hopefully, you'll drop in at some point. But um, we're um, we're going to talk about mining. Um, so there was a lot of like anticipation for the halving, a lot of talk, a lot of expectations, just for each of you. And we'll start with you, Alex, first. But how did the halving play out in terms of your expectations? And, and what has been the impact that you have seen on mining? What's happened as you've expected? And what surprises have there been? Um, I didn't really expect any price action as a consequence of the halving. And I feel like you know that actually kind of played out to T, um, just really range bound. I think on the hash rate side, there was just some simple back of the envelope math that you could do to sort of, you know, take a stab at thinking about what happens after the halving, you know, effectively really the simplest, you know, calculation, for example, is probably something like 40, 50 X a hash of S nines um, still in the market. Effectively, they need like at least $13,000 to break even. Um, effectively, you can just assume, you know, at least 50% are going to drop off and, at the end of the day, hash rate dropped from 120x a hash to something like 90x a hash. Now it's oscillating between that and 100. Um, for us internally, frankly, it doesn't really make a difference. We don't care. Um, you know, you only really focus on the inputs, the outputs take care of themselves. Um, so fortunately, haven't really had any any impact at all. Actually, it's just uh, always been another variable in the in the formula. How about you, Harry? Yeah, but likewise, you know, we we've been modeling these numbers for, for over a year in kind of post having terms. We've seen the last um, the last you know six to nine months basically is just kind of gravy revenue months. Um, if we don't have a business that's positioned, you know, to to thrive after the having, we shouldn't be building where we're building, and we shouldn't be you know built putting up sites at, at the cost that it would it would uh, take to do it. So. We've kind of been living in a post having world um, really since our inception. Um, and, and you know, similar to Alex, there, there's not a ton of impact that it that it had. You know, it's it sucks to see revenue get cut in half overnight, but but <laughs> it's what you signed up for. How do you plan for that cut in revenue overnight? Did, is it a case of you have to building some elasticity because you expect the price to go up over the year? Um, how does that actually work for miners like yourselves? I can jump in on that. You know, b basically, it, the the answer is don't don't count on it. So you know, plan the entire model, staff the business, um, procure assets with an eye towards basically post having rates of return. So if you can't, um, you know, if you can't uh, generate the the revenues and the retained Bitcoin earnings within you know within the having epoch that you're living in currently. Um, you need to be planning for for being able to do it in the post. So so all the all the business planning and the build out work that we're engaged in currently, you know, is either designed to have a, a four year or shorter projected life cycle where we expect, you know, the ROI on, on all of the dollars deployed sort of, you know, within the existing pipeline uh, will happen within the next four years and everything post four years, you know, is is gravy um, or you can business plan at the three and an eighth level now and expect, you know, everything that happens now to kind of be the extra. And then you're expecting to generate the rate of return at the three and an eighth having epoch. Yeah, because the um, the hash rate now is very similar to where it was at the start of the year. Um, and I also uh, read something yesterday that miners are selling off more Bitcoin now than have been mined since the halving, which implies that some miners are now having to dig into the reserves to uh, for for operational uh, capability. Is that something you expect is is happening across the board? Then 
I can't really speak for that, frankly, um, since, uh, you know, I don't really have good insight into other miners. I think it's generally opaque. Maybe Harry does. <laughs> I can't speak to what I know other miners to be doing because, you know, I, I wish uh, I wish I knew. But, but re you know, really kind of there, there are two questions implicit in what you asked, Peter. One mm -hmm. of them is a market microstructure question, um, and that's specifically related to just the number of Bitcoin that are being produced per day is is down to you know nine hundred net new, and you know if the if the demand on the order books is greater than you know nine hundred net new Bitcoins being purchased, there's going to be an, a natural upward pressure on the spot markets. So that's a market microstructure answer to that piece of it. On the other hand, I think there's a, a, an electricity cost uh, answer for it as well. Um, which is that, you know, if you're seeing there be, you know, additional, uh, you know, let, let's just think of the Bitcoin that are mined historically as retained earnings. Um, so if the retained earnings for other miners are getting sold into the market, you know, let's say to upgrade machines, um, it, it will imply that the power costs that they're uh, facing are either too high to, to support the existing hardware or that they see the time value of expanding their capacity as more value than the Bitcoin appreciation value of, of their current balance sheet holdings. So each of those gives you a, a unique insight into maybe the way that they're making decisions. If, if they're taking the approach that the, um, the machines they have you know, on hand are unprofitable, it's basically tipping their hand to the fact that they're in maybe that five, six, seven cent power and they're running the S9s that Alex mentioned. On the other hand, maybe they're saying that they're incredibly, incredibly bullish on the on the value of, of Bitcoin over time. And they're saying, I'm going to sell one Bitcoin in exchange for more than one Bitcoin of retained future earnings per rig. So th that's the other you know calculus they could be running. And, and, you know, in each case, I think it's interesting and represents opportunities, you know, for us in the mining community who maybe aren't at those operations. But it means that either Bitcoin is going to absolutely rip in the future or it means that um, that there maybe is some distressed hardware for a lower power cost operator to come in and snatch up. Matt, how you doing? Good. Sorry, I'm a little late here. I had a little technical difficulties, but Ben Ben got me through it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, so you just missed the first question um, post halving. Uh, how, how has everything played out compared to what you expected? You know, we. Um, we put out that report. So back in, you know, we wrote that up December, 2019, January, 2020. Um, so we put our, what we kind of expected and it's played out very, um, really to the paper. Um, we expected hash rate to drop about 30%. That's happened. Um, S nines have been shutting off. There's, there's now going to be pressure on mid gen, um, difficulty, adjusted the first epic um epoch and uh it will again probably around 10 11 percent um but now we're playing this game you know difficulty is truly net plugins of machines right so you're gonna get old and mid-gen uh under pressure and 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 to start continue to fall off the network because all these s19 pros are starting to deliver um the first ones those may batches are starting to come online in china um that coupled with the rainy season, you get more machines plugged in. So it's going to be this counterbalance. Um, so I think I think we've gotten a majority of our difficulty re relief. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we immediately had that 30% knockoff on the hash rate. And now you're going to see new generation equipment come online. Um, and hopefully, the pre that'll put pressure on old gen equipment, you know, S9s, that type of gear, coupled with the T2, T30s. That's more the mid-gen, um, and that should hopefully counterbalance a little bit uh, and hold back difficulty from rising a little bit, um, because those will there, there will be pressure on those, and they'll they'll come offline. So it's acted. I think I think overall, um, you're getting more efficient miners that are hanging around. Um, margins are still quite thin. When you really think about the state of of the Bitcoin industry or the bitcoin market we believe that the spot market is in a bull market and the mining market is in a bear market um and and to pull the mining market out of that bear market you need more inefficient mining rigs to come offline or you need bitcoin price 
to really continue to rally to improve margins. Um, and that's how you're going to pull the mining market out of a bear market. And I think that could take a couple months to shake out. So, so mining is in a bear market? Yeah, I mean, it absolutely is. Margins are thinner than ever, right? So, so that's just... I don't think so. Well, it's different... <laughs> It's different for it's different for everyone, but if your margins are margins really aren't a debate. It's just if you have a lower electricity rate, your margins are are higher than others. But if the price of Bitcoin goes up, then everyone's margins go up. So I don't think it's really a debate. Sure. What about nation state mining? So we've obviously seen that Iran is moving into mining. Is that a competition that puts fear into people like yourselves? Did they ever different ability to access uh, capital and a different way to access electricity prices because essentially they often own the grid. Is that something that concerns you? Is that directed to me or any of you? Well, I can, I can tell you a little bit about grids origin story is that mm. we, you know, it, when, when we were founded, we were the, the first friends and family money we raised really functioned like a search fund to travel the world and find the right power. And so we went to some of the places that, you know, that you're probably referencing that end in Stand and Vo and Osavo and Peru. And, you know, we, we looked around for these types of deals and, you know, there's a, there's a real, as an outside operator, I think that there's a massive barrier to entry when you're, you know, when, when, you know, part of the, the, the cost of doing business is getting into bed with an, with an oligarch who can say, you know, all your property are belong to me now. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's significant trade-offs. So as an outside operator, as an independent operator, you know, operating in the U S is drastically, drastically more attractive. We think, you know, we think that the, the types of property rights that are supported here and the ability to access capital markets that come from a jurisdiction like this are, are ridiculously more attractive, you know? Would I love to have 10 or 10 or 15 percent, you know, lower power costs that you're going to see in, in some of these places? Yeah. Would I would I love to have, you know, sit on top of an endless oil reserve that's, you know, handed to me at, at negative dollars? Maybe that's available to us here as well. But, uh, you know, the 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 nation states, you know, that that um, that we think about most, you know, most frequently are really the folks who own, you know, centralized, nationalized, um, you know, sovereign funds who have access to that energy generation themselves. You know, uh, I can't really play in that in that field with them just because I don't. You know, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go in there and, and expose the business to that level of risk. Do do these um, do these mining operations from these uh, nation states do they present any kind of risk to Bitcoin? You know, I I uh, if if it's a country that's sanctioned um, and they're accumulating Bitcoin to to get around sanctions. I think that's that that puts uh, it puts you know it's the the U.S. government's going to do something about it, and um, you know the U.S. government's in the business of protecting the U.S. dollar. That's that's just what it comes down to. And any threats, they're they're it's really the competitive advantage in the moat of our country. So so they're going to do whatever they can to protect that. So it's it's absolutely a risk. Um, I think overall nation states getting involved in Bitcoin um, is a positive rather than a negative. Um, you know, Bitcoin is 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 truly one of the last pure free markets. So I don't think you could tell people just because you're a nation state, you can't participate. Um, it's just where where I think things are going to progress into the future. Uh, it's it's going to be Nate. Whoever's got the lowest electricity, they're they're right it's the efficiency of a market so whoever's got the lowest electricity they should be participating in this so it could be nation states it could be utilities it could be you know we're seeing manufacturing plants that are participating because they just have excess power um and that's just where the space is gonna is gonna shift to especially over time um so i think it's i think it's okay and you know if you have if you don't have the lowest power then you may if you know eventually you will be at a comparative disadvantage over time. That's just that's just a market. What is the state of mining decentralization? Because it is something that's brought up occasionally, and there are competing projects working on improving decentralization within mining. What, what can you tell about that? If, if, start with you, Alex. 
Um, well, do you mean mining decentralization in the sense of how the hash rate is distributed or in the sense of the protocol that you use on the mining pool layer? Should do both. All right. Um, well, I mean, per your question earlier, I think sort of the incentives are aligned in such a way that frankly, geographic concentration isn't necessarily a tremendous risk, right? I think, I mean, even like Hustle and whatnot, a friend of mine had a great post about this like a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, I think on, you know, I think what's really interesting is like Stratton B2. I think there's a bunch of sort of low hanging fruit that people can do that really sort of are, are to the benefit of Bitcoin per se without really incurring any damage. I think certainly within our interest there, something like that, you know, hopefully at some point we'll be in the position to fund people much smarter than, you know, myself that can work on actually solving, you know, a bunch of these still existing technological there. Um, but yeah, you know, geographically, I think it's less of an issue. I think there's interesting arguments around energy security and the aligning of incentives between energy production and then the profitable consumption of electricity, creating a positive sort of a virtuous cycle that actually like benefits the ultimate region or country in which you in which you uh, in, in incept that process. On the protocol layer, I think at the end of the day, um, right, the whole thing is about okay, can we do something that's in the mutually you know best interest of positive sum game? I think uh, pool software will also migrate towards that. Um, it's probably going to take a while. Things are super slow for good reason in Bitcoin. However, um, I, I think it's inevitable and it's a good thing. We've got some uh, interesting questions coming in, which I think I'm going to uh, ping in across now. Um, Sarah Abbas asks, how do miners plan to use and price hash rate futures? And I think whoever answers that first, we go to you, Harry. Do you want to explain what hash rate futures are for anyone who's listening who maybe doesn't know? So the way that a hash rate future works in, in the current... Um, so FTX just released a new product, but I don't want to get into that one yet. Uh, very simply, a hash rate future is um, it's a forward contract. So we, the miner, take dollars today in exchange for physical delivery of the Bitcoin generated by the hash rate. Right. So basically, someone's buying in dollars your hash rate over a particular period of time to be delivered to their wallet in Bitcoin. Um, the reason that that's exciting is because it allows for Bitcoin price risk and difficulty risk to be quantified and locked in over a period of time. So other industry, you know, oil and gas is the, the easy one. Um, you know, there, there's a, a great example where, um, you know, years ago, I believe, I think it was Expedia, someone locked in an incredibly low jet fuel cost for a long period of time, just by basically hedging. Um, Bitcoin miners, will benefit from some component of of you know sophistication in the hedging contracts and you know we've worked uh with the folks at biduda um both on their on their hash contract and on some other sort of innovative hedging products um you know but but sort of when you get to any mature commodity market having the ability to control your margins uh, and control the, the nature of your exposure to the markets um uh, is an increasingly important uh, trait of that marketplace and will unlock additional net new dollars to, to bring into the industry because the folks who are funding, you know, new operations will be able to quantify the risk profile of what they're investing in, in, in a more concrete and tangible way. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, hash rate futures are interesting um, because, you know, with most commodities, uh, gold, oil, soybeans, you're really just hedging your margin, you know, with forward contracts, whereas hash rate, you're you're also hedging the rate of change, right? So so hash rate, um, you're you, no matter what, every ten minutes Bitcoin's released, right? Um, and you're really hedging out. So so there can't be suppliers that just cut off supply to fluctuate price like you can with other commodities, right? Oil drillers could just stop. Gold drillers could just stop. And kind of try and change or uh, control price um, by by controlling or choking supply. With Bitcoin, the supply just always comes, um, and that's what I think is the key difference in Bitcoin as a commodity versus other commodities. Um, and and uh, the profitability is is influenced by 
kind of the rate of change of new machines. So there's really two things that you have to, to, to hedge, which is the rate of change of new machines, which is what the hash futures do, as well as the price, you know, the spot price of Bitcoin. So it's it's a bit more complex to think about. It feels to me like the, uh, the the mining industry has become incredibly sophisticated over the last few years, way more complicated and more sophisticated than perhaps when people were mining on GPUs. How do you keep up with everything? We build it ourselves. <laughs> no, actually, though, I mean, I think the interesting opportunity why we are all here, right, including Harry and Matt, is uh, this is a blank canvas, right? It's an orthogonal industry to anything else in the real world which means it's, you know, really what do you want to make out of it? Um, I think that's so fascinating about it, right? You sort of actually affect the change that you want to see as cheesy as that sounds. It's, it's literally true. Um, you know, I think that's the spirit that also, you know, my co-panelists uh, sort of embrace here. Um, and really, you know, at the end of the day, you have to go through the cycles of an industry maturing. I think there's been a couple cycles. People made a lot of money doing very simple things. Now perhaps you can make more money doing a little bit more sophisticated things with a longer, you know, eye, a bigger vision, um, maybe a more sort of integrated approach. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Someone that does have a question in here for you as well. Um, Christian Satori asks you, Alex, does layer one use derivatives, hedging or other risk mitigation strategies in addition to load leveling business? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, effectively, we see ourselves as a liquidity supplier on three dimensions, right? There's energy or, or megawatts, there's hash, and then there's Bitcoin, effectively. And you want to, you effectively have like a capital allocation optimization problem amongst these three vectors. Um, and then the question is, okay, how do you lock in profitability amongst them? So on the energy side, you have this sort of virtual power plant that you build because you have so and so many megawatts to spend. And then the question is, do I consume them with Bitcoin? Do I resell them? Do I use demand response markets as a fourth play inverse battery? Um, there's different degrees of sophistication, um, including derivatives, yes. But even simple derivatives in, in the sense of forward swaps and whatnot is, you know, I don't know if that answers the question. On the Bitcoin side, I think that's more emerging like hash rate futures and whatnot isn't interesting to us i think it's more interesting for sort of lower margin producers that really just want to make sure they have a viable business and that's perfectly fine i think at some point for layer one it makes sense to start thinking you know how to transcend bitcoin mining and you know perhaps sort of instigate marketplaces that sit on top of its energy business um and that will certainly involve uh derivatives just in the sense of you know, structuring, not in the sense necessarily of ensuring profitability. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit more, um, it's shades of gray, right? So it's not a binary, it's not black or white. Um, so, you know, it's to ask for the point earlier, it's kind of uh, an incremental process. Um, so you can't really generalize that. It's, it's more sort of playing by year. And I think, you know, as long as you have a vision, then you can just uh, be a little bit more flexible. I would, also, I would also add there that there's implicit in what you just said, there's sort of a unit economics, um, uh, not the Gordian knot to, to untangle in the middle, which is basically that, yeah. you know, every, every Bitcoin mining operation ha is broken out into several legs. One of those legs is the, the doll, you know, the dollars per kilowatt hour or megawatt hour that you spend on electricity. The, the next closely related leg is, you know, what is the what is the the rest of the spend on, you know, a, a, an hour of uptime or an hour of opportunity cost of selling that power back. But then the third leg is, is not on the OPEX side, it's on the CAPEX side. So the one of the KPIs that we, we carefully manage our business to is making sure that we're spending appropriately on a per megawatt of capacity on the infrastructure side. So so everything south or everything upstream of the ASIC basically if you if you consider you know the ASIC the revenue engine and, and the pricing on the ASIC is you know somewhat variable depending if you're buying you know into the market or you're creating your own that you know the the unit economics of a site really comes down to what is that spend on a per megawatt basis on the build out um, and and you know we've seen a lot of blow-ups in the mining industry previously and so I'd, I'd be curious you know, Matt, you talk to a ton of folks and, and Alex, you're building these operations as well, same as us. Um, you know, on that on that per megawatt 
build out basis? How are you controlling and managing costs? The, the big blowups in the industry that we've seen on the mining side are always when people end up spending, you know, too much on all the wrong things sort of at that, at that build out level. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, well, you kind of got to break it down between open air and immersion. Um, if you're, if you're running open air, we've seen people spending 200 to 300,000, uh, a megawatt plus, which is egregious. Um, you know, I think you got to get it. I've, I've had, you know, it's also about where you're at in the market cycle, right? Cause you get individuals who want to participate in mining and, and, um, and, and they haven't done a lot of their research and the margins look good at the time. Right. So, so they spend like crazy and they want the Ferrari of a facility. Um, that's what one individual told me. He's like, I've built out the Ferrari of, of, of a facility. Um, you got to get clients in here. And I said, you're, you're going to blow out. Um, you want to do things lean. You, um, to me, to me, mining is truly a cost accounting exercise. Um, understanding your fixed costs and your variable costs, um, and really only spending with what's necessary, and and just as much to to not impair um, your effectiveness of of cooling, right? So that's quite different um, with with open air and immersion, um, but overall. If you're doing open air, I think you want to target 150k max per megawatt. Um, so, in terms of infrastructure, not including mining rigs. Uh, as a, as the little man been priced out of mining now? Is it really just uh, something for big players like yourself who can negotiate and buy with economies of scale? Yeah, definitely. The end of the bedroom miner. <laughs> yeah, but and, I mean, you'd want it no other way, right? I mean, it would be bad if it were the other way around because that meant that Bitcoin actually didn't, you know, take that step towards maturity, right? It's like wildcatters in the 1860s plugging some holes in some hill. Obviously, the industry matured since, and that's why we can have, you know, the world as it is. Um, it's, it has to be the same. Um, it's just cycles all the way around. Mm. Matt, are there any exciting things coming to the world of mining? It's not something I'm very close to. Do, do we do exciting things happen in mining? What one more time? What exciting things are coming to the world of mining? Um, you know, you're getting you're getting. I think keeping your eye on uh, the manufacturers, specifically uh, what's miner and Bitmain, and kind of how their machines. Um, you know, there's there's obviously competition as they continue to release different models. Um, I think so. The technologies are improving. Um, I think immersion technology is is super interesting, um, and kind of the uh, you know there's there's ways to capture efficiencies. You can do it at at with with the mining rigs. You could do it with infrastructure, um, and and being able to get the most out of your mining rigs while while staying efficient with electricity consumption. So there's there's many ways to optimize. Um, I know Harry does really good things with his management software, so you can optimize from that level. So it's it's truly a massive optimization game. Um, and whoever's capturing these different opportunities, they're, they're, mining is truly a comparative advantage against every other miner. So wherever you do it, whether it's cheapest electricity, most efficient mining rigs, and, and deploying at the right time, um, so getting getting the right prices on the mining rigs, um, using using a specific strategy, you know, open air versus versus uh, immersion, um, keeping those costs low, it's all just comparative comparative advantage against the other miners. What about you, Harry, Alex? Are there things that are exciting come up that you're interested in? Um. I mean, it's difficult to ascertain what exactly. I think at the end of the day, you know, you do have a unit of electricity that you're turning into a unit of money. And then as per Matt's point, you want to optimize for that conversion. I think you actually have to unpack so much that's involved in that conversion, which is so fascinating, right? It's really interdisciplinary from semiconductors to energy, to cooling, to effectively real estate, to software and so forth, right? It's the bundling of all of these individual components. Um, and at the end of the day, then the interesting thing is, 
you know, the next level is, okay, the Bitcoin you mine are the same Bitcoin you can use to settle derivatives with, right? It's a digital commodity instead of a physical commodity, like oil and gas, you have no transformation, refinery, distribution costs. You know, effectively liquidity is the only competitive advantage. And obviously that, that you know, creates a whole different uh, dynamic in terms of um, how that how that comes together. Um, yeah, it's really the combination of all those things. Nothing specifically, but rather just the the final output of of putting the pieces together. We've got some questions here, so we'll run through some of these. Um, Amanda Fabiano from F Fidelity, what's your biggest concern with Bitcoin mining, hardware centralization, procurement, pool centralization, anything else? Do you want to throw one in? You got anything there, Harry? My biggest concern. Um it would be around the hardware i think that i think that um the the dynamic that we're seeing emerge you know with with bitmain and microbt um the the supply chain the immaturity uh, on the quality hardware um is really uh, it's really the kind of the, the most vulnerable piece because it's the piece that's out of control for most miners um that you know you know if you if your delivery shows up 3 weeks late you're not getting compensated 3 weeks worth of lost revenue so it's the it's the most vulnerable component, and and you know there's just as much complexity on trying to fab it yourself. You know there's a there's a lockup of funds. There's no guarantee that you know that your wafer and your ASIC mask are going to come out the way that you need them to. It, it, there, there's just a tremendous amount of risk on the hardware side um, that we have kind of yet to see a mature producer uh, inside the space, um, and and that comes down to the service model that these companies are offering. You know MicroBT is making strides. Um, extending their warranty to a year, offering you know some relief on on some longer duration pre-orders. But you know the day that an Intel enters this this marketplace, you know, or or you know someone you know is able to generate you know many you know triple digit megawatts worth of their own ASICs that are performing you know at whatever call it 30, 30 joules per terahash or better. Um, you know that that's going to remain the most vulnerable place. I can sign a better electricity agreement. You know, I can always I can always do that. I can't go back to the foundry and get better wafers. Are you still getting an, uh, like is it like an error rate with the machines you're receiving that just operationally don't work? Yeah, so so there have been some pretty seriously concerning um, failure rates on especially some of Bitmain's S17 series. Um, these are pretty widely you know publicly available and, and well tracked. Um, you know, it seems like that hardware run, the S17 Plus, S17 Pro, T17, you know th those units. Um, you know, th there were either corners cut on the assembly side, or there were um, you know de you know degraded components that were included. You know. There, there's a lot of um, difficulty and complexity with that particular machine run, you know, whereas you didn't see that type of thing happen with the S9s of the past. And so that, you know, what that means functionally is that a significant, uh, a significant percentage of the dollars allocated to this hardware across the industry may be underwater from a revenue performance perspective. So I think that's something to definitely keep an eye on. We probably haven't seen the knock on effects from that happen yet. We're probably closer to seeing that maybe three or four months from now from some other folks out there in the industry. All right, I think it's a um, Amanda's question is um, fair to ask ask you all, Matt. What about yourself in terms of the industry? Anything that particularly concerns you? You know, I think um, hardware's hardware's a really good point, especially because it gives China a competitive advantage. You know, when you look at um, the S19 Pros, those were released to China first. Everything kind of goes to mainland China first. Um, so it's that exacerbates, uh, you know, I, the Bitcoin network is decentralized. You know, people discuss 65% of mining is happening in China. Well, that's just, that's happening among several different entities. It's not one entity doing that. So it's still decentralized. Um, but overall, I think we want to have as much geographical decentralization as well, because there's just risk, inherent risks with the Chinese government. Um, and it's, in my opinion, less of a risk in, in, in uh, other regions. Um, so with all the manufacturing happening there, uh, it exacerbates that, that, uh, that lack of that centralization in, in China, and it makes it more difficult to, to really um, decentralize it more, you know, 
Um, I think our, I think what the U.S. markets have uh, is is excellent. You know, we're starting to see a lot of financing come in for miners, and and that can really jumpstart a lot more mining in the U.S. Uh, I think our our advantage is going to be our capital markets, specifically debt, um, and and that's the most robust in the world. That's why Canaan IPO'd over here. That's why eBang is trying to IPO over here, um, and that's why we're starting to see uh, a lot of debt financing and the ability to collateralize mining rigs that's all kicking off so those those lenders are gonna are gonna require miners to operate in the u.s so i think that's positive and that could try and help um geographically decentralized mining i'm conscious of time and there's a there's another couple of really good questions if we can get through um, one from thomas fox i'll put this to you alex um, how do mining businesses factor in upcoming halvings which will inevitably lead to bitcoin's block rewards being all right, it's 100% based on transaction fees. I mean, we're, we're a long way off that. But uh, just referring to this question, like how many halvings are you thinking ahead? And how much are you thinking about the fact that um, in future, a lot of your revenue will have to come from uh, transactions? I think it's about, in, so if you think of uh, all miners in the world distributed on a single chart or a curve, Right, you can effectively just like very simply boil it down, okay, to what is your all in price for electricity, right? If you want to have like a very simple sort of uh, methodology, the point in mining, because you have two variables that are correlated, obviously not causally related, but correlated, is you always have sort of the scheme theory aspect, right? So, effectively, all you actually want to do is you want to insulate yourself at the very leftmost part of that curve, and then no matter what happens to the bitcoin price or the hash rate or whatever um you're always going to retain profitability because people drop off before you right that's the entire beauty of uh the system um in terms of how it operates so if we think about different halvings of course on a notional basis right it 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 literally halves our revenue on the other hand um if you continue to believe in the security of such system, well then honestly, the only priority should be optimizing for insulating your hash rate and effectively monopolizing that chunk for yourself um, and then creating some moat around that, right? Um, at least, you know, that's our objective. And then effectively it doesn't matter, you know, what happens to the price or, or halvings and so forth or transaction fees. Of course, at some point, right? I think there's a, still a couple, little bit of work to be done in Bitcoin in, in order to figure out how things will be once you have you know, the year 2140 and the full transition to transaction fees. But I mean, I'm optimistic on my life, but you know, <laughs> it's a long way out. Um, but regardless, um, obviously there, there's some pr upward price directional risk that you incur um, um, with that belief. But in the meantime, um, on the mining side, really it's just about, okay, am I a more efficient converter of electricity to Bitcoins? Can I build a moat around that where I differentiate myself, isolate myself and that distribution and then you should be fine all right um dan mccardle's asked a couple of questions on immersion i'm going to put those to matt because i've heard you mention them um how big is immersion uh, a lot of the big miners starting to use this and he wants to know the cost per megawatt difference between immersion and open air you know i think alex is probably more proficient to answer that I, you're, you guys are running immersion right yeah i mean i, I can't talk about numbers of course um i can say that i our payback period is, you know, definitely significantly less than a year all in, which has favorable economics. I think there's different approaches in the industry towards it. You know, for us, it's all about creating a fully integrated product at our at our factory that then just literally just turnkey, right? You just ship it, deploy it, and energize it, and that's it. Um, I think maybe others have more interesting solutions but you know for us it's just bundling putting everything together in the most cohesive way and offering the the most attractive economics um so yeah i mean immersion cooling is the only way really you can survive 110 degrees fahrenheit in west texas it's the only way you can really do sustainable overclocking it's the only way you can play inverse battery with the energy grids at scale right and the only way you can deploy multiple megawatts per day um, and, and capture economies of scale. So I think regardless, that's where the future of the industry will be. It's just a function about catching up. Um, you know, perhaps other companies are also well underway there. That might be, I'm not sure. Um, but for us, you know, we've really built conviction around it and that's what the, what the heart piece of our company is around. And then effectively you want to 
you know, build a business um, that's defensible around that technology. All right. I'm going to do one last question. This is one from Will Drevo. And uh, he asks, who are the typical institutional investor profiles for mining farms? Why do they see them as investments they'd like to be in? I think it's, you know, when you look at deploying to the blockchain industry, um, I think a lot of the Web3 hasn't been too attractive. And if you're an institution and you want to write a five, 10, $20 million check to a project, it's most scalable when mining. Um, you know, if you're, if you're deploying towards the, the liquid assets or, or different projects, there's just not a ton that's investment grade. Um, but with a mining operation, you could, you, you can be an institution and write a $20 million check um, and, and participate. Um, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're deploying to a feeder fund, you might only be writing half a million, $1 million checks to different projects towards different coins. Um, so there's not a lot, if you want true exposure to blockchain and, and, and to Bitcoin, other than just buying and holding Bitcoin, um, I think the best way to do it, especially with large checks is mining operations. And it's also, it's also this yeah. energy play infrastructure. Um, so, so it's really, I think it, it really is a function of an institution being able to get um, a way an exposure to Bitcoin that can deliver alpha above just holding um, as well as capitalize on like this, on, on the energy play and also be able to write a large check that makes it worthwhile for them. Yeah, it, it, it's it's position sizing and the ability for a miner to print Bitcoin dramatically below spot. Like that's the like that that's to me the whole story. Like if I wanted to spend a hundred million dollars getting into getting exposure to Bitcoin, mining would be the the absolute obvious play. You know, you're backstopped by the hard physical assets. You're at, you're backstopped by the value of the energy relationship. You can you can plow basically endless dollars into into this space. Um, and you're basically buying Bitcoin at a you know a fraction of the of the spot price. Fantastic! All right, great session, guys. Mining is definitely something that's a bit out of my depth, but thank you uh, for taking me through this. Really appreciate it. Good to see you again, Harry. Nice to see you, Alex. Good to see you again, Matt. Um, take care, all of you, and hopefully I'll see you soon.